Hi, this is Anil Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Insight. And today we have with us once again, Dirk Honda, VP and Chief Open Source Officer at VMware. Dirk, first of all, welcome to the show again. Thank you for having me. Love talking to you. I want to talk about, uh, because there are a lot of things happening in this open source space. Uh, licenses, foundations. I don't want to get into uh, the nitty gritty of it, but I do want to talk about higher level overview that why do we do open source? You have been part of the committee for so long. So I want to just kind of deep dive. <laughs> Did you just uh, say yeah. I'm old? No, no not really. <laughs> I am your old, beard, that's fine. <laughs> your, your beard may lie, but uh, a shout out to Subsurface also. Let's deep dive into the kind of history of open source. Why do we do open source? So this all, of course, started long before it was called open source. The name open source is just, I don't know, 20 years old. It all started with free software. It started with Richard Stallman's idea that, that you should have the code that runs on your system. You should be able to fix bugs in it. You should be able to extend it. And, and this is we're going all the way back to you know, the late 70s, early 80s where people were suddenly switching from a world in which software always came with what back then counted as sources. And, and the idea of packaged software, of things that were closed, suddenly started to emerge. And where the firmware for devices started to be a thing that's actually like software. And suddenly all of that was locked away from you as, as a user. And so to Stallman, it was super important that you had that right, that ability to fix bugs, to make things better, to make things uh, to just work for you. I mean, fundamentally, just make things work. And, and from that perspective, which is a very engineer, software developer-driven worldview, he started to collect people who felt the same way that, yes, you should be able to fix bugs, extend the software. And slowly, this, this migrated from a person with the vision to a movement of more people who try to, to as a group, create uh, the first software packages that followed that vision. I mean, early on, things like Emacs, the editor, some of the basic Unix tools, the, the GCC compiler, a lot of the underpinnings of, of what makes software work today. And in a very real way, this is the creation of the first software community in that sense that people were collaborating across companies, across borders on creating better software. And that's really the starting point, very much driven by a vision, by an almost an ideology, a very strong feeling for what's right and what should be there and not driven at all by a user perspective. This is something I am kind of confused about. When you look at Richard Stallman's philosophy, the user was in the center because he himself, as his user, wanted access to the driver. Uh, at the same time, even if you look at the four freedoms, he mostly talk about the user should have this right. User should have the right to ed 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 see the code, edit the code, audit the code, redistribute the code. So from what I see is that he was more concerned about how much access I have as his user. I use the word user differently. To him, the user was a, an engineer. To him, the user was someone like himself. Because if you look at the average user of software today, as we use the term, that's typically not a software engineer. That's typically not someone who would even want to be able to fix a bug. So that's never what this was all about, right? And, and so that's why I'm differentiating. Yes, Stallman certainly talked about it as the user, but I don't think that's really a fair description of, of what he meant with that term. I think at one point you and I had a discussion about consumer versus users. So I think what I was implying towards were more or less like consumers, you know, consumers of Uber who just sit in a car uh, to go from place X to Y. But actual user is Uber itself, who is not only consuming a lot of open source, but also creating. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so thanks for clarifying that. So when we talk about users, just for our audience, is we are talking about the stakeholders, the developers who are using these technologies and also working on it and creating something new. So, uh, so basically, user was in the center. Uh, more power to the users uh, who also happen to be developers. Now, when we look at that time, as you said, you know, projects started, then community start growing. What happens is when a lot of people start 
coming together, become part of community. Even if you don't like the word, it does become critical to manage that community because people from different backgrounds, different ideas, different uh, motives, they come and join. So what role does, you know, or do things like foundation play there? Or, uh, I mean, FSF came into existence, Linux Foundation came into existence, VMware also has foundation. So I want to understand, you know, once we, you, you graduate from a single developer user to a community of users, what is the next stage, next step for a community? I think we, we need to fast forward through the first 10, 15 years of the evolution of free software. Because initially this was very small, limited by the, the, you know, the early days of ARPANET, of, of exchanging free software with tapes at, at user group meetings, all kinds of, of different approaches to, to working around the limitation of the conversation medium that people had. I mean, you and I are doing an, an online video conference for your video channel on the internet. Go back to 1988, and that's a ridiculous thought. Everyone was on a 9600 or 19,200 bold modem. So, actually having a video conversation over the internet is a ridiculous idea back then. So what changed was that in, in the late 80s, early 90s, internet became omnipresent enough, widely available enough, and fast enough that people could actually collaborate more effectively and efficiently over the internet. And through that, and through the fact that almost all universities immediately got onto the internet across the world, suddenly that audience that was this little free software click, the small group of a few hundred, maybe thousand people working together became significantly bigger. The reach became significantly bigger. Now it turned into a more diverse community with more ideas, more visions, more directions, more of all those things that made it complicated, that made it more, more challenging to have just one person say, this is what I want. And now we see a lot more projects uh, uh, created with different visions of what it means to be free software versus software resources available. What, what is the meaning of these freedoms that Stallman carried about uh, versus the things that these people wanted first and foremost? And then, of course, enters Linux, and, and that really was kind of this inflection point in the open source movement, where suddenly we went from all these ideas about Herd and the GNU project to having a Unix kernel and having the basis that allowed us to, to really do something useful and productive and, and uh, um, that, that very quickly, over just a few years, became truly a replacement for commercial Unix systems. And that really is when all of this changed and when everyone's attitude towards free software, towards open source software, the term was coined not much later than that, uh, it suddenly became important. One more thing uh, has changed ever since you know, Linux kind of become, uh, Linux made it very, very easy for companies to, to embrace open source as well because they could see very clearly they can compete in the market. The sales team can compete, but the developers can collaborate. So how much role do you think Linux played in, in this, you know, uh, making open source more kind of, you know, uh, what is the right word? Uh, not only accessible, but, you know, it was, like, yeah, open source is something that we can try to do. So this is a, a question that I've often asked myself. So what are the factors that actually converge to create this new reality. And I, I typically talk about three things. I talk about A, having a reasonably complete OS. So something that you could actually run without having to pay somebody else for software first. And Linux was there in like 93, 94. We were pretty close to having a, a, a full OS. The second part is obviously the internet. I mentioned that before, the ability to very cheaply communicate to a lot of people. And the third part is, is actually my old employer, Intel. The fact that with the 386 and then 486, a, a, at this time, workstation scale machine suddenly became affordable to a lot more people, a machine that had 
a true MMU that has address protection, that had the hardware infrastructure that made it possible to create actually a Unix system. And there was also extensible enough and, and broadly, diversely developed that, that a lot of new ideas were brought into that system in very, very rapid succession. So to me, it's the confluence of those three things, having the people, having the community through the internet, having enough software that you can actually do something with it, and having a hardware platform on which this can be widely deployed, widely used, where developers could afford to join this as a hobby. That really is that inflection point where it changed. And then you add another five-ish years, and in, in 98, Oracle suddenly says, we are going to support Linux as one of the supported platforms for the Oracle database. So that's the second inflection point, where suddenly we have an, an industry giant recognizing this as a viable OS platform, and suddenly enterprise open source, enterprise Linux, enterprise software became a thing, and therefore money entered the system. Sure, I mean, companies like Zuse, Red Hat, and others existed before that moment and catered to the individual developers and sold <laughs> to the modern audience, that will sound crazy, the, the little hard boxes that had six CDs in them, which you used to install your software. Crazy thought, right? Actually, the initial boxes had floppy disks in them. But my point is we, we switched from a, a monetization model that focused on individual developers and therefore was very limited in the total addressable market to something that now became enterprise software and that was a totally different ball game. And that's when we see the switch from this being mostly hobbyist developers, mostly people who did this at the university, who did this because, you know, why did most people start open source development back then? Because you downloaded it and it didn't work on your system. And you're like, crap, it doesn't support my graphics card. It doesn't support my hard drive. There is something wrong with my Ethernet card. I mean, this is how I started. I, I downloaded version 011, and it turned out that it couldn't work on my 2 megabyte, M megabyte, 386SX. So I fixed, I broke things in the kernel that actually made it work on my system and broke it on Linux, Linux's system. That was our first interaction ever, by the way. <laughs> and, and so the, the, the fundamental idea of people just joining this as a hobby, joining it to do something they loved, versus being paid to work on it. That's the second, that's what followed out of the second inflection point. Right, so a lot of things happened at the right time, uh, uh, and that's what led to that. Uh, you you uh, touched upon a, a point that I was going to ask next, was that as, you know, as Oracle Linux, uh, not Oracle Linux, but Oracle Database it started supporting Linux, and as the, the enterprise uh, Linux or enterprise open source came to exist, it also changed the face of the community itself. As you mentioned, a lot of developers were not working in their free time. How does that change the community itself, which earlier used to be somebody working in their free time to just patch something or scratch their own itch versus somebody who's working full time to solve not their problem, but the problem of their customers. It changed the whole uh, community itself. So this is, of course, a gradual process. And, and a lot of the people who were the first employees, the people who were paid, were you know, six months earlier, the hobbyists working in their spare time. So this is not a switch that was flipped, but it's a process over several years. But what it changed was kind of the, the underlying motivation, the underlying dynamic between developers. Because whether I discuss with someone else something about a problem for myself that I need fixed, or whether I have the job to get a certain feature into that piece of software, fundamentally changes my motivation, changes the way that I engage. And it changes the dynamic as suddenly one company may have 10 people working on something, and through that, shift the direction of that project. And you can, you can, of course, take this to the extreme. You can take a project that is fairly small, has a handful of developer, company comes in, puts 20 people on that, suddenly they 
Well, control is a weird word, but certainly massively impact, massively influence that project. And so who is making the rules and who gets to decide what goes into that project? A lot of problems that we didn't used to have because it was much more one-on-one -on -one relationships and one-on-one -on -one conversations about, oh, the thing you do over here breaks me over here. How can we fix that? Versus I have this deadline, I have to get this done, this needs to make it into the kernel or into whatever project. This is not just about the kernel. I mean, the kernel is kind of the easy example for this, but the same is true for the compiler. The same is true for a lot of the basic tools that went into the, the OS stack. Right, and it's, it's you know, I, I want to talk about, I think we, at one point, I also want to talk about how it also changed the way projects are being managed, as you rightly mentioned, different people are coming from different companies working on the same projects. So I want to I want to keep a dedicated show just to talk about open governance. I just want to talk today uh, just about the evolution of open source in today's world. As more and more commercial uh, companies are using and uh, writing open source project, how it has how has it changed the the community in general? Because uh, as I said earlier, a lot of motivations came from you yourself being a user of the project and you go in there and fix it versus, but in that model, what I did feel as an early user myself, I would touch base with the developers and if they have time, they'll do that or they'll tell me, hey, you can go and fix it yourself. Versus now, it is kind of, you are, as a developer, you are more accountable. You cannot just say, hey, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's my free time. I cannot do that. So how has this changed the face of open source itself? Uh, because commercialization, I feel, has made it more accountable as well. Well, so that depends very much on the projects because the ratio between paid developers and unpaid developers is very different in different projects. So in, again, Linux kernel is an example today, 90 plus percent of all the developers working on it do this as paid work. You mentioned earlier my heavy project, Subsurface, a dive lock, 0% of the developers do this as paid work. So we absolutely will say to our users, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't think anybody's going to write this because <laughs> that really is the answer that people get from us. So open source has become so diverse in not in the, in the diversion and inclusion sense, sadly, but in the so many different types of projects and so many different situations from really big, really corporate, really accountable projects where there is a, a, a system around collecting all the crashes, collecting all the bugs, a team that looks at bugs, evaluation, prioritization, assignment of tasks, very much like enterprise software development just across multiple companies. And on the flip side, you have uh, still a lot of open source projects who are reminiscent of the 1990s, where it's just a few people who are highly motivated by an idea, who are users themselves and are trying to scratch their own itch. And as all of their itches are scratched, they're looking to other users and saying, hey, is there something that you want? Subsurface today contains a ton of features that I never use, but that I'm happily adding because there is a a few 10,000 people who use it and, and who are looking for these things. So when we talk about how communities has, have changed, I think we should not talk about how it went from here to there, but we should talk about how it went from here to all these things. And yes, at the, at the commercial edge, at the more enterprise-focused side of, of, of projects, you look at something like OpenStack, you look at something like Kubernetes that are very much driven by the commercial users and by the companies who create businesses around that and who then insert developers, insert resources, Q&A, whatnot. Um, and so there is a ton more accountability. There is a ton more structure. And this, this line between free software, hobbyists, and enterprise proprietary software is really sometimes becoming pretty blurred. And community as such, it feels more like, uh, I often have said that in many cases, enterprise open source software today feels like the new version of the joint venture with fewer lawyers involved because it's really a few companies coming together and figuring out what they want to do together, like 
years ago you did in a joint venture and today you do this in open source. But this is also where many of these foundations come in that you mentioned earlier to loop back to, to your prompt. Because the OSDL, the predecessor of the Linux Foundation, was really created to have this shared resource, this lab resource to test Linux on larger systems, on, on clusters, on, on, on hardware that the individual developer wouldn't have access to. And so the big hardware companies came together to fund that and to provide that. And that was the underlying starting idea for that. But it became a framework that allowed people to collaborate in a way that upheld many of the core beliefs of open source software and, and of, of being open, of being inclusive, of bringing in more people, of allowing anybody to contribute and, and to provide their value, while also giving the, the corporations more of a understandable environment where they understood how it worked, where they felt there is a structure that they're familiar with. And so as we go through this evolution that we talked about this, this in this whole interview, this whole conversation, um, the, the creation of these foundations and the increased role of these foundations really is kind of the, the final step in all this, where now instead of the individual developers talking to each other, the companies that employ them also talk to each other and have that forum and have that second meta level of conversation about the direction in which these projects should be going and where they want to invest and how they will collaborate and how the different pieces could fit together. It's very much a maturing of this whole ecosystem to a new level. The, the nature of the community has not changed. It's just the players have changed. Instead of having individuals, it's just you know the, the organizations who have those individuals as developers. But even if you look at foundations, most foundations have a governance model. We'll talk about that separately where code is still, you know, developers are still in charge of code. You know, even if you join, you know, Linux Foundation, any other organization, you have board membership, you are not influencing the code flow. That decision is still make, made by the developer community, if I'm not wrong. Is that correct, right? So the code still comes from the developer com uh, community, but the companies, in, in those more corporate projects have more influence over direction, over what happens. This is really this, this, this fundamental tension between what can I achieve by inserting money into this process, by inserting resources into this process. And, and the, the, the fact that open source still is largely about code and about engineers and about the, the projects that are being created and the fact that developers and maintainers still play this overproportionately large role in ensuring that we create software that actually serves our own needs and serves the needs of, of our employers. That hasn't changed. The structures around it have grown up, have become more mature, but the underlying base idea that this is Fundamentally, software developers coming together, working together on a problem, and trying to create better software. That has been the same ethos for the last 30 plus years. But more thing that I see these foundation, uh, uh, foundations are, you know, these you know, enterprise customers, when they become part of the community play is that uh, standards. I do remember the big giant story that I did, and there was a lot of controversy around OXML, you know, a couple of years ago, when Microsoft came up with their own format and the Document Foundation and everybody. But nowadays, if you look at it, the communities, you know, whether it's Kubernetes, you mentioned OpenStack, they come up with their own standards where all the stakeholders, they do work together. So they, we have kind of gotten rid of I mean, there are still standard organizations there that they do work in networking space. But how much role do you think it has played in standardizing technologies so that you don't have to worry about X is creating Y and all those interoperabilities through that we had at one point? So I think open source has fundamentally changed the standards world. Standards still exist. Standards are still absolutely critical in many environments. If you think about telco, you want your cell phone call to go through. There need to be very strict, very narrow standards in that whole stack of, so things work. Every time people mess with standards, uh, I, I, I can tell you stories about Bluetooth low energy and the lack of standards in that space and how horrible it makes 
Bluetooth low energy communication between your computer and the device, say a dive computer. <laughs> How do I get there, right? But uh, standards are really important, yet a lot of what in the past, 20, 30 years ago, was done through standards bodies who necessarily are slow moving, very conservative, very deliberate in their approach and, and don't really match today's developments approach, development speed. Um, so standards have been augmented by open source software. And you see this, this, this range between things that are really driven by, I write a standard first and then I implement this. Yeah, telco space, definitely uh, you know, uh, high, high risk environments, safety critical environments, you see that versus I write software, I start with the software, and once it works, I say, well, actually, this is how it should be. So let's, let's say this API is version 1.0, and we call that a standard, and everyone agrees on that. And then there is that, that zone in between. You see organizations like the Linux Foundation engaging with standards bodies, engaging with the ISO and other international standard organizations very much to, to bridge that that gap and, and bring together that fast moving, innovative, inclusive open source approach to create, let's call them de facto standards. And then the more deliberate process of a standards organization to create a written standard and, and join those two and bring them together so that the best of both worlds happens. But the, the, your underlying question, standards have been fundamentally changed by open source software development, yes. Uh, Dirk, uh, thank you so much once again for, for talking about the history and evolution of open source communities and uh, how foundation came to exist. And I would love to talk to you uh, about open governance model uh, in the next show. So let's, uh, let's get ready for that one. And once again, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and I'm looking forward to the next conversation. See ya.